So hi, everyone. Hello. Happy Friday. My name is Robert. I'll be your MC. Uh, Ed Moser, my good friend Ed Moser, is going to be our host for tonight. And this is part two of Ed's talks about books that he's written. Part one was on the United States Capitol. If you missed that one, I'll post the link for that program in the chat in Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook. It was also included in the email that you were sent that has the Zoom information for this program. Um, we're also recording this program. So if you have to drop off at some point in time, or if you want to watch it again, or if you know anyone else that would be interested, um, you'll have that available to us. It'll be on our YouTube page probably I don't know, sometime tomorrow, if I had to guess. And so with that, I will turn things over to Mr. Ed Moser, who is, a, among other things, a author, a historian, a tour guide, and many other endeavors, but I'll let him tell about that. So with that, again, thanks so much for joining us. And Ed, oh, one last thing. If anyone has any questions, feel free to type those in the chat or the Q&A, and Ed will try and answer as many of those as he can when he gets to the end of his program. So with that, Ed. It's all yours, take it away. Thank you so much, Robert. And uh, thank you for history and culture in uh, hosting me again tonight. Uh, I'm gonna be speaking about the uh, the White House's unruly neighborhood. I'm, a, uh, I'm the operator of the Lafayette Square tours of scandal, assassination and intrigue uh, that has as our flagship tour, Lafayette Square, uh, the neighborhood in and around the, the White House. Uh, the, the illustration that you see is uh, of a book that I published uh, last year from McFarland Publishers, uh, The White House's Unruly Neighborhood. And it, it chronicles uh, over two centuries of, uh, of hidden history, wild history, a lot of mayhem, uh, scandals, assassination attempts, uh, crimes, murders, uh, along with some inspiring things as well. So uh, I'll, I'll speak about it tonight. Uh, I'm the operator of the Lafayette Square Tours. Uh, I give about 75 different tours in the Mid-Atlantic region on history. Uh, the, the White House book was a prequel of sorts to my current book, which came out last month. It's, uh, it's a lost history, a hidden history, if you will, of the Capitol, the Capitol building and uh, of Congress. And uh, the, uh, so that's, uh, I, that's the sequel, uh, if you will, to the, uh, the White House book. Uh, I've, ha I've had other books, including comedies, uh, political comedies, such as Foundering Fathers, uh, whose premise was the, uh, some of the Founding Fathers and Mothers like Abigail Adams, Ben Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson, they're cloned uh, by mad scientists and brought into the present day contemporary Washington where they get into all kinds of uh, misadventures. Uh, also a serious, a more serious uh, history, uh, the two-term jinx about the two-term presidents uh, throughout American history uh, and how the, the troubles, the turmoils that they got involved with, uh, involved with very often in their uh, second term in office. Um, the, uh, I have a couple of meetups, like Robert, I have a couple of meetups for my history tours. One of them is called the Washington Area Discovery Hikes. Uh, there's a picture of the White House uh, circa 1825 on its cover uh, with President John Quincy Adams actually in the, the lower right fore foreground. And uh, my, uh, my other tour, uh, very similar, is the Lafayette Square Tours of Scandal, Assassination and Spies uh, meetup. And um, we'll be focusing on that tonight. Uh, uh, the flag, uh, one of our, our flagship tour is right there in Lafayette Square, uh, where we take our guests. Um, I had some very good news uh, over the last couple of weeks for my uh, Capitol building book. I was interviewed by uh, sort of a legend in the history field, uh, a fellow named Brian Lamb of C-SPAN. For decades, Brian Lamb has uh, interviewed uh, noted historians and authors on his uh, book notes program, and he recently relaunched it into a Book Notes Plus program of podcasts. And uh, he interviewed me for an hour the other week and it just came out this week. So if you're, you're interested in learning about the Capitol building's history, as well as the White House area's history, I would check out this, uh, the C-SPAN Book Notes Plus. Uh, I'm listed on there uh, at the top of the page for this week. The, um, I, I also should add that I have a, a series of podcasts of my own on all the various, uh, all the various uh, uh, outlets, Apple, Spotify, uh, Amazon Music, uh, about the, uh, the White House's unruly neighborhood, in which I read chapters from the book uh, in my podcast. There's 12 or, or 12 or 15 chapters from the book which are narrated in the podcast. So if, uh, if you're interested in, the, in, the, in tonight's subject, you might check out uh, those as well. Uh, why don't we get started? 
on Lafayette Square, the subject of tonight. There's a picture of Lafayette Square, uh, the, the General Jackson statue in the middle, the White House behind it. A little bit of a trivia, uh, uh, Pierre Lafont, when he was designing Washington, D.C., uh, he instructed that the president's palace, the, uh, what became the White House, would have a memorial to General Washington right through the, if you go right through the center of the White House into its background, there would be the future Washington Monument. But you see that the Washington Monument of today, of course, is about 100, 100 meters to the left of the center of the White House. And I like to ask people why that's the case. And the case is that the, at the time of LaFont and the founding of Washington, D.C., the, what is today the, uh, the National Mall was very much a swamp. It was very marshy. And if you took what was the largest man-made edifice on the planet at the time, the Washington Monument, uh, and planted it in a swamp, it would have sunk. Uh, so the Army Corps of Engineers placed it on, on the hill where it rests today on much more solid ground. Uh, so it, it doesn't quite fit LaFont's uh, vision, but uh, it has withstood the, the test of time. Uh, interesting question of uh, how did it all begin? Let's begin at the beginning. How did the Lafayette Square come, come about? When the city of, of Washington was founded and was being constructed in the 1790s, the, the land on which the White House and Lafayette Square stands was then owned by a, um, a Scottish farmer a fellow named uh, David Burns. And this is actually a photograph of his farmhouse. If you look behind it to the right, you can see the Washington Monument. This photograph was taken around 1900 or so. And this was the house of a David Burns who actually owned the property on which the White House was built. He's often confused with this fellow, David Byrne uh, of the Talking Heads, but it's a very different fellow. He was a Scottish merchant, uh, excuse me, a Scottish farmer who owned all the land. And he went into negotiations with the, the first federal government led by President Washington. And uh, he, he proved to be in Washington's terms, an obstinate Scotchman. He refused to sell his land uh, on which the future White House uh, and Treasury Department and State Department uh, was built. And he actually demanded a meeting with President Washington. The meeting was extremely contentious. Uh, David Burns told President Washington that he wouldn't be where he was today if it hadn't been for Martha Washington, for the rich widow that he had married. Uh, very insulting language. Nobody talked to George Washington like that. And Washington actually stormed out of the meeting. Uh, and he had the city commissioners running the construction of the city with LaFont to uh, finally make David Burns, that obstinate Scotchman, an offer he couldn't refuse. Uh, and he, he sold the property. Uh, to Washington, uh, to uh, President Washington's new government. Now, when David Burns died, his considerable fortune, all the money that he had gotten from the, the Washington administration, when David, Byrne died, David Burns died, all his fortune devolved to his only child, his uh, lovely and intelligent daughter, uh, Marsha Burns. And she became the most eligible bachelorette in early Washington, D.C. Uh, she had a fortune. She was attractive. Uh, her father had made sure that she went to finishing school. She knew foreign languages, knew how to play the piano. So she had her pick of every man in Washington at a time uh, circa early 1800s when there were almost no women in Washington, D.C. Almost every, every person in that sleepy southern village of D.C. in the early 1800s was a male working in the, uh, for the administration, or working on Capitol Hill. And uh, the man that she settled upon was, a, uh, was quite the catch, a fellow named Peter Van Ness. He was a general in the militia and a congressman from New York. And those of you from Washington, D.C. may recognize the name Van Ness as a metro stop. Uh, the Van Ness um, Metro is indeed named after Martha Burns Van Ness and her husband. And uh, it would seem that they would have a life, live ha happily ever after, but uh, they were stricken by Washington's first pandemic, uh, the cholera pandemic of the 1830s. And Marsha Burns Van Ness could have been like a lot of the wealthy people in Washington, D.C. And during the epidemic, she could have uh, escaped to the countryside and ridden the epidemic out. 
But instead, she became sort of like the Florence Nightingale of Washington, D.C. She rolled up her sleeves and she tended to the sick, uh, the many, the thousands of people in, in D.C. who were afflicted by cholera. Hundreds died. It was a, a real disaster. Tragically, Marsha caught the cholera herself and she died from it. Uh, and her husband, uh, Congressman and General Van Ness, built a wonderful mausoleum for her. Uh, he originally, it was built in downtown DC. Here's the, the mausoleum where the Van Nesses rest today. It's, it's, it's sort of odd. Uh, it was sort of like a movable mausoleum. It was built in downtown DC. And then when Peter Van Ness passed on, the, the mausoleum was taken apart, stone by stone, brick by brick, and it was transferred to, the, to Georgetown's beautiful Oak Hill Cemetery. And that's the photo that you see today. Uh, the, move, the movable mausoleum, if you will, and it's it's also odd, and uh, it's sort of like a we're a week after Halloween. It's sort of like a Halloween story. The movable mausoleum wound up in a movable cemetery because Oak Hill Cemetery in Georgetown was originally in another place. It was on the other side of Wisconsin Avenue in Georgetown at, at Volta Place, which is a now which is now a public park. The problem with the original cemetery in Georgetown was that when there were torrential rains. Sometimes the rains would wipe away the soil covering the coffins and coffins would pop out onto Wisconsin Avenue and swept down towards the Potomac River. Uh, this just wouldn't do. And so they moved the, uh, the Volta Place Cemetery to Oak Hill Cemetery today, where the, the mausoleum of, of Marsha and uh, Peter Van Ness is today, a wonderful place to visit. Now, I, I like to ask people, I like to show people this next illustration and uh, ask them what building it is. Bit of a hi history trivia question, if you will. I show this illustration and most people say, well, that's the White House. And then they might do a double take and say, wait a second, it's not exactly white. Though it does sure look, it's a dead ringer for the South Portico of the White House. And what this is actually, it goes back to, again, the founding of Lafayette Square in the White House in the 1780s the US minister to France was traveling through Bordeaux and he, be, he came upon this chateau, the Chateau de Rastignac in France. 10 years later, he was secretary of state to President Washington and his name was Jefferson, a fine architect himself. And some historians believe that Thomas Jefferson who had fallen in love with the Chateau de Rastignac in France and had copied the architectural diagrams of it at a local, from a local French lyceum. Historians believe that he handed the diagrams from the Chateau de Rastignac to the architect of the White House himself, James Hoban, uh, an Irish architect who did a lot of the public architecture in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, and certainly in the 1950s, when the South Portico of the, of the White House was redesigned, it seems that they, the, the designers then did draw upon the Chateau. It's sort of like the secret history of the White House. Uh, but the, that wasn't the only influence on the executive mansion. Because if you look at this illustration, when President Washington and Secretary Jefferson saw this, they fell in love with its architect, namely James Hoban. This is the uh, courthouse in Charleston, South Carolina, designed by the Irish architect, James Hoban. And when President Washington saw this, he said, this is our man to build the executive mansion. And in fact, if you take a, a good look at it and knock out the bottom floor, it's really a dead ringer for the, the front of the White House itself. So the, the courthouse in, in Charleston, Chateau de Rastignac, discovered by Mr. Jefferson, and you have the, uh, the White House of, of today. So it's sort of a secret history, hidden history of the executive mansion itself, the, uh, the centerpiece of Lafayette Square. Uh, interestingly, when Mr. Jefferson became president in 1801. Lafayette Square was then a, the president's preserve. It was actually the president's park. It was even called that. It wasn't a public park. Jefferson thought this smacked of European royalty, that a president of a republic should have his own palace, palatial grounds, like an English king. That wouldn't do. So he directed that Pennsylvania Avenue, and here's a picture of Pennsylvania Avenue, outside the White House in 1950, he directed that Pennsylvania Avenue be built to separate the White House from what became Lafayette Square, the, the President's Park. It became a public park 
uh, at that time, which was thought to be more democratic. Um, now, working in the President's Park at the time of the Jefferson administration was this lady who uh, is really unsung in American history, but she grew up to be, she became one of the great philanthropists in the history of DC and had some of the greatest impact in American history. Uh, her she had a beautiful name. Uh, her name is Alethea Tanner Browning. Uh, this is a miniature of her from uh, the early 1800s. And the remarkable thing about Alethea Tanner Browning was that she was a, a businesswoman, one of the first businesswomen in DC, but she was also a slave. She was of mixed heritage, black mother, white father, and she set up a very unusual business in President's Park. She ran a, uh, an open air grocery selling fruits and vegetables during the Jefferson administration. She was extremely good at what she did, Alethea, because she earned enough money to buy her own freedom on the order of $1,400, a huge sum in circa 1804. But she didn't stop there. Alethea Tanner Browning, she made enough money from her, her grocery business to buy the freedom of her whole family, over 12 relatives. And one of her relatives, her, one of her nephews, actually founded the first black church in DC, one of the first black churches in the country. Uh, it had a wonderful name, uh, the M Street Preparatory School for Colored Youth. And in the 20th century, the M Street School took on a different name, a name that's well known to Washingtonians. It's today known as the Paul Dunbar High School, uh, named after a, a noted black poet and satirist. And a, this is a picture of a, of a graduate from the Paul Dunbar High School uh, in the early 1900s. He went on to Harvard Law School. He became the Dean of, of excuse me, of, of Howard University Law School in DC. Uh, his name is Charles Hamilton Houston, and it was he who led the legal team, which in 1954 won the Brown versus Board of Education case in Arkansas, which overturned public school segregation in the United States. It's incredible when you think about it, the, this enslaved woman who earned enough money through her own business to buy her own freedom and that of all her relatives, one of whom set up the, the, one of the first black schools in the nation, which became a high school that graduated Charles Hamilton Houston, who went on to overturn the, uh, the segregation laws in public education. Uh, an astonishing accomplishment for uh, one of the uh, lesser known heroes of Lafayette Square in America, Alethea Tana Browning. By the way, the uh, Alethea's grocery store, if you will, was probably at the corner of today's Pennsylvania Avenue and Madison Place. That's where there was a lot of traffic and where you could get a lot of customers for your business. And that area became a nexus of civil rights in Washington's history. Right across the street from where she probably worked was uh, an enterprise run by this fellow, very recognizable, that's Frederick Douglass. And in the 1870s, he ran something called the Freedmen's Bank, uh, as in free men and women of color, which held the deposits of thousands of uh, recently freed persons right after the Civil War. And then right next to the Freeman's Bank in the 1940s, if you look at this photograph on the right side, there was a theater, a music hall at the corner of Madison Place in Pennsylvania Avenue, probably right across the street from where Alethea Tanner Browning worked. And the Blasco Theater was probably the first place to have integrated audiences for its uh, musical shows in the 1940s during the Second World War. Washington still had the Jim Crow laws uh, of segregate, segregated audiences, although there was probably a nod and a wink at U Street with the famous uh, jazz clubs where the likes of Ella Fitzgerald and uh, Louis Armstrong played. The, some of the audiences there were, were integrated, but officially the Velasco Theater was integrated during the, the Second World War because of the large numbers of uh, black soldiers from America and from all around the world, uh, especially from the, the French empire and French Africa, they were allowed to attend audiences of all, all stripes, if you will, at the Belasco Theater, which uh, sadly has passed on into history. Uh, some, of the, some of the owners involved, uh, uh, their descendants helped run the National Theater 
at 14th and Pennsylvania Avenue today. So some inspiring stories. Another inspiring story having to do with Lafayette Square has to do with the fellow that the square is named after. This is a, a very nice portrait of the, the key man to our key ally during the American Revolution, the Marquis de Lafayette. And uh, he, his story, the story towards the end of his life, I find amazingly inspiring. I like to tell it on my tours of Lafayette Square. Uh, in 1824, when Lafayette was in his 60s, half a century after the American Revolution started, he was invited to make a tour of America, a reunion tour of America, by a man who had uh, saved his life, Lafayette's life, after he had been wounded on the battlefield of Brandywine during the American Revolution. The, uh, the man's name was James Monroe, then a very young uh, Virginia sharpshooter, uh, helped save Lafayette's life from a wound. And in 1824, James Monroe was president, invited Lafayette to America. He went on a tour of all the states, from Tennessee to Virginia, at Monticello, he got drunk with Thomas Jefferson for 13 days. They cleaned out his wine cellar. <laughs> he visited George Washington's grave at Mon Mount Vernon, fell to, fell to his knees crying, a very emotional man. He ended his tour in Massachusetts, where incredibly he met John Adams, who was then in his 90s, uh, still alive and kicking. And Adams invited Lafayette to lay the cornerstone of America's first Battlefield Park, Bunker Hill, Bunker Hill Battlefield Park, just outside Boston, uh, famous in the early years of the American Revolution. Don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes of the advancing British troops. Lafayette lays the cornerstone of the battlefield. He gives a speech. Hundreds of thousands of, of people in Massachusetts line the streets trying to get a glimpse of one of the last links to the American Revolution. After laying the cornerstone, Lafayette does a very unusual thing. He walks onto the Bunker Hill battlefield with a shovel and he starts digging up the earth and he fills two big sacks with soil from Bunker Hill. He then gets in his carriage, goes to Boston Harbor and goes back to France. And uh, 10 years later, 1834, he dies. He dies a very frustrated man because while he was successful in the US with our revolution and establishing a democracy here, fledgling democracy, in France, he's the odd man out. Uh, the kings and, and Napoleon have taken back control of France and they see Lafayette as a threat. They can sign him to his country estate. They make sure he has no power because they fear him. They know he's popular with the people and he wants to establish a democratic republic in France like he, didn't, like he did in America, but he never succeeds in his own country. So he dies somewhat embittered. And in 1834, he's buried in Paris at this cemetery when an unusual event happens. His son rolls up to his father's grave as his coffin, as Lafayette's coffin is being lowered into the ground. His son's name is uh, George Washington Lafayette. Uh, who was sort of an, almost an adopted son of George Washington himself. And George, La, George Washington Lafayette reaches into his carriage and he pulls out two sacks of two big sacks, the same sacks that his father had filled with the soil of Bunker Hill Park, of Bunk, Bunker Hill Battlefield Park. And Lafayette's son walked to his father's grave and spread the soil from Bunker Hill on top of his father's coffin so that for all time, the Marquis de Lafayette looks up upon the soil of a free nation, a nation that he himself had helped to free, uh, even as he was denied democracy in his own, own land. So Lafayette gets the last laugh on the tyrannical kings and monarchs of Europe. So I think that's a, like Alethea Tanner Browning, it's quite an inspiring story uh, that, that you often find in, in Lafayette Square. Just to quickly go through uh, the other statues in Lafayette Square, uh, the, all, all the statues are of noble, all the statues at the four corners of the square are of uh, European noblemen who came to America to help us win our revolution. Uh, pardon the uh, Alamy uh, icon here in this photo. I may have to pay some uh, copyright uh, royalties to Alamy for this. This is a, a statue of Thaddeus Kosciuszko, 
who was from Poland and Lithuania, uh, a land that was constantly under the thumb of the Russian czar. There's a wonderful statue of a Polish peasant at, at the bottom of the statue holding up a scythe, holding up a scythe probably against the Russian invader. Uh, Kosciuszko was denied freedom like Lafayette in his own country, but he came to America to help it obtain its own freedom. Uh, and although a poor man in his, in his dying days, in his last will and testament, uh, Kosciuszko gave up the few dollars that he had, the few kopecks that he had to buy the freedom of American slaves. Uh, quite the character. The, uh, the, another statue on the other side of Lafayette Square is of the, uh, a German-speaking nobleman, the Baron von Steuben from German-speaking Prussia. And he was the drill master of the American army at Valley Forge. Uh, he taught the raw American recruits uh, how to drill, how to be disciplined, how to use the bayonet. He was shocked that the Americans didn't know how to use a bayonet. They actually used them to uh, spear their meat and cook their meat over the, over the fires at Valley Forge, at, at Freezing Valley Forge. So uh, he taught them how to use the blade, which came in very handy at the climactic battle of the American Revolution at Yorktown, uh, where there was a night attack led by Lafayette and by Alexander Hamilton to capture a redoubt or for uh, fortress of the British. And it was done completely without firing a shot, without bullets, merely through a bayonet attack, a, a stealthy bayonet attack uh, late at night. Uh, von Steuben has been the subject of uh, speculation uh, since his death and uh, the building of the construction of his statue in the early 1900s because uh, rumors flew around von Steuben at the time of his life that he may have had a predilection for men uh, at a time when many, uh, quite a few gay men stayed in the closet, if you will. And the sculptor of the von Steuben statue may have tried to get this message across with the uh, statue of two figures at the bottom of the von Steuben statue. Here's a close up. It shows a Roman legionnaire teaching the arts of war to a young boy, a naked young boy uh, with an unsheathed sword. Some have speculated that the sculptor was trying to make a, uh, give a, uh, a, symbolically, the predilections of Baron von Steuben. Uh, others deny this and it's been a historical controversy for quite some time. So sometimes you see hidden meanings and symbols in the statues in Lafayette Square. And uh, the, the other, statue of a foreign nobleman in the square is of this fellow. And there's a, a scandal attached to his family, an interesting a bit of scandal. This is, the, uh, this is General Rochambeau. And he was the head of the uh, French army in America during the, French, uh, during the American Revolution. He, he led the French forces at Yorktown, uh, along with George Washington and Hamilton and Lafayette and others. Very nice official portrait of, his, of him back in, in Paris. Interesting story, however, when Rochambeau and his fellow French officers were in Yorktown in Southern Virginia, they behaved, oh, let us say they behaved like Frenchmen. They admired much the local women folk and the local women were wowed by the French officers on hand. They had never seen such cultured, handsome, well-dressed men as these French officers at Yorktown. And it's now known that one of Rochambeau's close relatives, either his son, pictured here, the Comte de Rochambeau, Count of Rochambeau, or his nephew, the Viscount of, of Rochambeau, one of his close relatives had a, uh, a bastard son with a local woman in, in Yorktown. Incredibly, here's a picture of the boy, very handsome. and. Uh, Marsh, uh, military genes must have run in his blood because incredibly, uh, the offspring of the Rochambeaus grew up to be the head of the US Navy, which was then quartered at the, uh, what is today known as the old executive office building just off Lafayette Square, uh, which then housed the, the Navy department and held the headquarters of uh, the young man, the offspring of the Rochambeaus. Incredibly, his headquarters were within a stone's throw of his probable uncle, the General Rochambeau, just a stone's throw away from the, the future 
Navy Department and uh, War Department building that the bastard son of a Rochambeau actually headed. So uh, it's it's quite the uh, quite the story uh, of the Rochambeaus and their offspring in the New World. Now, speaking of uh, sex scandals, if you will, Lafayette Square was the center of the greatest sex scandal in Washington D.C. history. The greatest scandal, sex scandal in Washington D.C. history. And that's a bold claim, but I think I can back it up. And it relates to the statue in the center of Lafayette Square, the statue of General Andrew Jackson, shown in victory at the Battle of New Orleans during the war that began in 1812, the War of 1812. Uh, that battle in which he smashed a uh, highly favored British army, losing but 12 men while killing over 1,000 British soldiers, the Battle of New Orleans made Andy Jackson the most popular man in America, and it, it shot him into the White House in 1829. However, his administration was plagued from the start by a, a serious scandal involving this beautiful daughter of a Georgetown tavern keeper named Peggy O'Neill. Peggy O'Neill had been married to a, a Navy accountant and he was often overseas and uh, he died overseas, some say of drink, some say of a broken heart. Because while he was overseas, Peggy O'Neill Timberlake, her husband's name was John Timberlake, Peggy O'Neill Timberlake began having an affair with Jackson's Secretary of War, a man named John Eaton. Uh, soon after Peggy Eaton's Peggy O'Neill Timberlake, soon after Peggy O'Neill Timberlake's husband passed away, she married the Secretary of War for Jackson, John Eaton, without really a period of mourning. It was quite scandalous, and it horrified all the cabinet members in Jackson's gov government, and especially the cabinet member wives, uh, who referred to Peggy as that, that hussy, uh, and uh, refused to have anything to do with her, and it paralyzed the cabinet. And President Jackson couldn't get anything, anything done for his first two years in office. What finally happened was his uh, Secretary of State, uh, the only bachelor in the cabinet who actually liked Peggy, uh, a fellow named Martin Van Buren, future president. Uh, Martin Van Buren suggested that everyone in the cabinet resign, allowing President Jackson to appoint a new slate of, uh, of advisors, which he did and he rolled to re-election in 1832. The person most alienated by the, uh, by the uh, Peggy O'Neill scandal was Jackson's vice president from South Carolina, a man named uh, John C. Calhoun. And by the way, if I can backtrack a little bit, uh, the Peggy O'Neill scandal has been the subject of many books and movies over the, uh, the next two centuries, including, <laughs> This uh, Hollywood poster from the mid 20th century called the, the Gorgeous Hussy, The Life of Peggy uh, O'Neill Timberlake Eaton, uh, played by Joan Crawford uh, with jo uh, Robert Taylor playing John Eaton. Uh, so she's been the subject of a lot of cinema and books. But the, the scandal that ensued most enraged Jackson's vice president, John C. Calhoun, pictured here, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Forced out of the government, his hopes for the presidency were dashed. So he went back to South Carolina, became a senator, and started the movement for secession and nullification of federal laws by the states. It was really a template for the Civil War that came 30 years later. Uh, Calhoun was sort of the apostle of secession, of leaving the federal government. And uh, so you, you could say that Peggy O'Neill she triggered the largest sex scandal in DC his, history, the ouster of an entire cabinet. And she also almost brought on the Civil War. Uh, interestingly, in her old age, her behavior continued the same. In her old age, she became, she, uh, she outlived her husband, John Eaton, and uh, inherited his money. They had several children together. And with his money, she started a, uh, a prominent and successful business in downtown DC, uh, sort of like uh, Alethea Tanner Browning, one of the early female businesswomen in the, in the city. Uh, 
she had a problem though. She started to behave like in her early age, in her 60s and 70s, because she took up with an Italian gigolo, with an Italian dancer named Antonio Buccinani uh, in her old age with this young Italian, young Italian dance instructor who promptly took off with one of her granddaughters and took off with some of her money as well, Antonio Buccinani. Well, Antonio was a good dancer and a good lover, but apparently bad with money. He squandered his fortune and he came back to Peggy tail between his legs and begged her to take him back. And she agreed on one condition, that he marry her granddaughter. Thus did the woman who triggered the biggest sex scandal in Washington history and practically bring on the Civil War. In her old age, she made a respectable, respectable man out of a foreign gigolo. Uh, one of the many scandals uh, in the background of Lafayette Square. And, and I should add that John C. Calhoun, by the way, was quite handsome in his early age, pictured here in the 1820s. He died in Washington around 1850. And this is what he looked like at his death. John C. Calhoun in his old age, John C. Calhoun as a dashing young man. It is said that Calhoun is the poster boy for having term limits, term limits in Washington, D.C. No politician should outstay, outstay his welcome. Now, my tours are tours of scandal, uh, assassination and intrigue and espionage. Uh, we, we covered a couple of scandals and I wanna to turn to a couple of uh, violent episodes in the, the hidden history of Lafayette Square. One involved this mansion on Madison Place, which stood there on uh, perhaps the worst day in American history, which was April 15th, 1865, April 14th and 1816, April 14th and April 15th, 1865. 1865 was the last year of the Civil War. And on that date, there was a terrible incident in downtown DC, which I'll get to in a moment, but there was also a terrible incident at this mansion house, uh, right on Madison Place, right across Pennsylvania Avenue from the, from the White House. Living there was this man, President Lincoln's top advisor and his secretary of state. This is William Seward, uh, sometimes known for Seward's folly for acquiring the state of Alaska a few years later, a uh, very wise counselor to Abraham Lincoln who had gone through hell uh, a couple of weeks before. Uh, while the, while the, the whole city of Washington was celebrating the looming end of the Civil War with marching bands and festivities, uh, musical bands, William Seward, was convalescing in his mansion house because he had had a terrible carriage accident. He had been thrown from his carriage and he had broken his neck uh, and he had broken his arm, his left arm. Uh, his arm was in a cast and his neck was in an iron brace. And on April 14th, the night of April 14th, 1865, he was on the second floor of his mansion uh, convalescing in a bedroom with his daughter, Francine, uh, a Union Army sergeant, and a Union Army nurse, when came knocking at the door, came knocking at the door of a mansion, a very tall and very muscular man uh, named Pal, Lewis Pal, who had a wrapped package with him, knocked on the door, the butler answered. The butler by the name, William Seward's butler's name was Butler, William Butler. And the butler asked the visitor what he wanted. And the visitor said, I have a package here of medicine to give to the convalescing Secretary of State. And I must give it to him personally. The butler told the man that, sorry, that, that, that wasn't possible. No, no uh, strangers could see the Secretary of State. The stranger pushed the butler aside and rushed up to the second floor of the mansion where he was met by Seward's son, um, Augustus Seward, the Assistant Secretary of State, and who, told the visitor that there was no way that he could see his father, that he would take the package of medicine into his father. The visitor, Lewis Powell, reacted by pulling out a, a pistol, pointing it at the son of, pointing it at Seward's son and pulling the trigger. The gun misfired. So Powell took the butt of his pistol and he caved in the skull 
of Seward's son, high ranking Secretary of State official, State Department official. Francine Seward then made a terrible mistake. She heard the commotion in the hallway and she opened up the door, the bedroom door to her, where her father was resting. That gave away the location of Seward. And Pal, the interloper, came bounding down the, st bounding down the corridor towards the bedroom. Francine, the nurse, and the sergeant locked the door. But Pal was so strong, he was able to break the door down. He then took a knife and he jumped on the bed, jumped on the bed where Seward was lying and began slashing away, began cutting him to pieces. He actually cut him all the way from the ear down to his chin. Big flap of skin opened up, exposing his teeth, exposing his jaw. Horrified, Seward rolled off the bed and broke his arm again, his broken arm, he rebroke it. Uh, he then crawled under the cot. The only thing that saved him as Pal went for the jugular and tried to stab Seward in the neck, the only thing that saved him was the iron brace the iron brace that he had around his neck from his broken neck in the carriage accident a few weeks before. Pal then was pushed out of the bedroom where he ran into one of Seward's other sons, another State Depart Department official, and he stabbed, that, he stabbed that son as well. He then began running down the hallway to escape and he smashed into a courier from the State Department and he stabbed that man as well. He was like a terminator. In the space of a few minutes with just a knife, a malfunctioning pistol and knife, he wounded over a half dozen people. And he apparently killed Secretary Seward because uh, he, uh, his daughter Francine opened up the window of the, uh, of the mansion house and began screaming, murder, murder, my father has been murdered, just as Lewis Powell exited the mansion. And uh, <laughs> it's an incredible story. As he left the mansion, the butler, William Butler came rushing out to a group of Union soldiers who were in Lafayette Square. And he pointed the pal and said, this man has just tried to kill Secretary Seward. Arrest this man. The Union soldiers turned to the butler and they didn't believe him. They said, ah, you're crazy. You don't know, you, you must be drunk. And they walked away and they allowed the would-be assassin of the Secretary of State to depart. Now, Seward was, was, in a, was looked to be dead and his his daughter Francine was screaming, was screaming out of the window, murder, murder, to all the residents of Lafayette Square. As she was screaming, Seward opened his eyes and he said this, he said, I am not dead. Close the house, send for a doctor, send for the police. He then closed his eyes and lapsed into a coma. But he survived and about 10 days later was propped up next to the window where on Pennsylvania Avenue, he sadly watched the funeral procession of Abraham Lincoln go by because April 14th, April 15th, that terrible night while Seward was being assaulted, John Wilkes Booth had entered Ford's theater and the presidential box and had shot Abraham Lincoln to death. And the, the Lincoln assassination was just part of a series of murders that uh, John Wilkes Booth and his henchmen planned that night. They also helped, they also hoped to kill Seward and they also hoped to kill the vice president, Andrew Johnson, uh, who was staying at a hotel on Pennsylvania Avenue. But the, uh, the assassin sent to kill the vice president at the Kirkwood Hotel. Uh, he went to the hotel bar and got stinking drunk, lost his nerve. So the vice president was spared, the secretary of state, recovered from his wounds, but of course, Abraham Lincoln uh, died that night. It's uh, one of the, probably the most violent incident of a series of violent incidents that have occurred in the history of Lafayette Square. What happened to Lewis Powell, the assassin? Here's a Matthew Brady photograph. Matthew Brady was the very famous photographer of the American Civil War. And he took this picture of the very young Lewis Powell on board a Union Navy ship uh, in chains and manacles uh, before his trial. Uh, interestingly, a lot of the women of the time took a fancy to photographs of Lewis Powell and they actually wrote him love letters asking him to marry, marry them. Uh, the same thing happens today with murderers on, on uh, 
sometimes they'll get letters from women around the country asking for matrimony. It's just a bizarre phenomenon. But what happened to Powell? Of course, he was convicted of attempting to kill the Secretary of State, was sentenced to death. And this was his fate, along, along with the rest of the Lincoln conspirators. They were hanged at uh, what is today Fort McNair across from Haynes Point in Washington, D.C., uh, including uh, one of the persons hanged was the only woman executed in America in the 19th century, and that was Mary Surratt, uh, at whose boarding house in today's Chinatown the, the Booth conspirators had met. Incredibly, Lewis Powell cheated death for a while. He was so strong, this uh, Confederate veteran of Gettysburg, he was stro so strong that when his body dropped from the gallows, uh, he was able to pull his knees up to his neck and stop. He was able to pull his knees up to his chest, I should say, which prevented his neck from snapping on the rope. And for five minutes, he dangled below the gallows on the rope until finally the hood over his head caused him to suffocate. His body went slack. Uh, he was the last of the Lincoln conspirators uh, to die on the, on the gallows uh, pictured here. Uh, one, of the, one of the very violent inc incidents in the history of Lafayette Square. Uh, another incident occurred more recently on October 1st, 1950. This is the uh, south portico of the White House. It kind of looks like the Chateau de Rastredac, uh, which was probably part of its inspiration. Uh, the, the president in 1950 was this fellow, pictured with his talented daughter, this is Harry Truman with his uh, very musical daughter, uh, Margaret Truman, uh, at the uh, grand piano she liked to play. Problem occurred in 1950. This piano fell through the second floor of the White House, fell partly through it, because the White House was falling apart, literally falling apart at the seams. And the Army Corps of Engineers, the Army Corps of Engineers insisted that the president and his family move temporarily actually for two years, to move to the Blair Lee House on Pennsylvania Avenue. It's the, uh, the white buildings to the left of this photograph, and to the right of the Renwick Gallery. Uh, the Trumans lived there actually for two years while there was a massive reconstruction project on the White House to make it safe for, for living. Now, at the Blair Lee House, security was a little bit less than it was at the White House. There was no fence. There weren't many Secret Service agents or, or DC policemen there, just a handful, in fact, protecting the president during a time of war because the Korean War had just broken out a few months before. And on October 1st, 1950, two men who had shadowed and staked out the Blair Lee House for a day, they approached the Blair Lee House where Truman was staying, and it was two o'clock in the afternoon, Truman had just had lunch and was taking a nap on the second floor of the Blair Lee House, uh, which is by the way, the place where foreign dignitaries will stay when they visit like the queen of England, uh, the president of uh, France will stay at the Blair Lee House instead of the White House when they're in town. So Truman was taking a nap on the second floor of the place, two o'clock in the afternoon when these two men, very natally dressed, fedora hats, they approached the White House, guarded by just a handful of security. The two men pulled out pistols. One of the men fatally shot DC policeman, this DC policeman, his name is Leslie Kaufelt, fatally shot him uh, just outside Blair Lee House. Kaufelt, though, as he was dying, was able to fire back and wound one of the two would be assassins of the US president. The other assassin, incredibly, on the steps of the Blair Lee House, realized he had made a terrible mistake for any assassin. He had forgot to fully load his revolver. And he stood on the steps of, of, the, of Blair Lee reloading his gun while hell was breaking out all around him. Secret Service, DC police, his, his, his fellow assassin all firing at each other. And look at Pennsylvania Avenue in 1950. It was then a regular city street. Not like today, it's been a pedestrian mall since 1995. 
since the Oklahoma City bombing, when officials feared that a, a domestic or foreign terrorists might do what happened in Oklahoma City, take a truck bomb and explode it outside the White House, causing a great deal of damage. So Pennsylvania Avenue has been turned into a pedestrian mall ever since. But in 1950, it was very much a city street with trolley lines and cars and buses. And a huge crowd gathered to watch this mayhem, this gunfight, where the president was staying. Uh, a Secret Service agent did a very smart and counterintuitive thing. He actually ran into the traffic of Pennsylvania Avenue, away from where the president was staying, and he drew the fire of the assassins towards him and away from Truman, which was very lucky because as, that, as the one assassin was reloading his gun on the portico of Blair Lee House, who stuck, who stuck his head out of the window of the second floor? None other than the president, President Truman, who had been awakened from his slumber by all the gunfire and might easily have been shot to death. The crowd on the street saw Truman appear in the window and they screamed out, Mr. President, go back inside, go back inside, please go away. And his, his head disappeared back inside the building to safety. Uh, the other assassin, uh, both assassins were shot down. And uh, incredibly, the uh, Associated Press photographer who was on the scene took a photograph that won him the Pulitzer Prize for photography that year of one of the assassins shot dead right at the, the foot of the steps of the Blair Lee House. This is actually the assassin who survived. One of them was killed. This man actually survived and got a very long prison sentence at uh, Fort Leavenworth. Notice how well he's dressed. Uh, almost looks like a, a mafioso. In fact, if you hear the names of some of the, uh, the assassins, uh, Torosola, Grisolio, they sound Italian. You might think, was the, was the mafia trying to kill the president? Actually, they turned out to be from Puerto Rico. They were Puerto Rican nationalists who thought that by killing the U.S. president, they would win independence for the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, like most murderers, would-be murderers, they weren't that smart, and they didn't get their aim. Uh, many of the stories in Lafayette Square have astounding follow-up tales. This is certainly true of the Truman assassination. If you were at the Secret Service, and by the way, uh, we just had Veterans Day yesterday, and the uh, the, the most hollowed ground for uh, America's fallen heroes is Arlington National Cemetery. And the DC policeman who gave his life protecting President Truman that day, Leslie Kofeld, his grave is in Arlington National Cemetery, along with thousands of military heroes. Should definitely mention that. Now, if you, if you were with the Secret Service and the president had just survived an assassination attempt, and the president was scheduled to speak at Arlington National Cemetery just a couple of hours later that afternoon. Now, obviously you would demand that the president cancel his speech. What was Harry Truman's reaction? Get the armored limousine out. I will not be cowed by these murderers. And with secret servicemen hanging on the running boards and the roof of his armored limousine, Harry Truman drove out to Arlington National Cemetery just hours after the attempt on his life. And he gave this speech, he gave this speech here, unveiling a, uh, a statue of a British general from the Second World War, General John Dill. It's actually the first, this equestrian statue is the first statue that you see at Arlington National Cemetery when you walk from the visitor center towards the graves. Truman, <laughs> Truman gave the speech that day. And to show you how much culture and communication has changed since 1950, it wasn't until Truman started to speak that his audience, largely of military men, that a titter ran through the audience. Gossip, a titter ran through the audience. Did you hear what happened at Blair Lee House? Did you hear that someone tried to kill the president a couple of hours before? <laughs> because people got their news from often from late afternoon newspapers. There was no internet. There wasn't the instant communication of today. And so even ranking military officials were <laughs> unaware uh, for hours that the, there had been an attempt to kill the president. So uh, another one of the violent incidents that have, uh, have occurred in uh, Lafayette Square, uh, a scene often of tragedy. And uh, speaking of which, I want to tell a story about one of the most sorrowful stories in the history of Lafayette Square in the White House neighborhood. It involves this magnificent mansion, uh, which stood 
where the Hay Adams Hotel is today, right across from the square, from the President's Park. The Hay Adams Hotel, formerly the Hay Adams Mansion, which you see here, built by one of the great architects in American history uh, of Richardson uh, from Boston, the designer of Trinity Church in Copley Square, and the magnificent uh, City Hall in Albany, New York. Uh, he built this Hay Adams Mansion for two very wealthy and well-connected men. One of them uh, is pictured on the right here during the Civil War with his boss. On the right is John Hay, who was Lincoln's private secretary during the war. He went on to be Secretary of State for, among others, Teddy Roosevelt, and won the Pulitzer Peace Prize for Teddy Roosevelt for settling a war between Japan and Russia, the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, a wealthy man uh, by the time of circa 1900 when this mansion was built, kitty corner to a friend of his, also a very prominent man, this fellow, uh, Henry Adams, a noted historian and author of the time, intellectual. The name Adams, he was the great grandson of the first first family to occupy the executive mansion, namely John Adams and Abigail Adams. This is their great grandson, Henry Adams. A uh, friend of uh, Mr. Hay, and uh, they lived side by side with their wives and families at the Hay Adams Mansion. Henry Adams fell in love with an extremely talented, lovely woman from Boston named Clover Hooper. Here she is pictured on a horse, a uh, Boston Brahmin, one of the first uh, professional female photographers in the world, really. Uh, art books still study her photo. This is a photograph of hers. Here's another one. Very artistic, very evocative. Uh, she had a problem though. Uh, she had a suicide gene that ran in her family. Uh, tragically, her, both her brother and her sister committed suicide uh, by throwing one through himself out of a window, one through herself in front of a speeding train. And when Henry Adams' friends learned that he was going to marry Clover Hooper, they begged him not to do so, that he was just asking for trouble. That, uh, but he insisted that he loved her. He knew what he was getting into. Come what may, he was willing to face it. So, so great was his love for Clover Hooper Adams. And uh, tragically, one day, Henry Adams was coming back to his mansion, had run into a friend, had run into a friend of, of Clover Hooper Adams. And uh, he said, oh, I'll, I'll bring you back to the mansion and introduce, introduce you to my wife. And they went up to the second floor to uh, the Adams bedroom. And what did Adams see? He saw his wife sprawled out in front of, in front of their bed, dead. She had committed suicide. She had taken potassium potassium nitrates from her photographic lab and had swallowed cyanide in effect, killing herself. Uh, the suicide gene had come to pass and the dire predictions about the marriage between Henry Adams and, and, and Clover Hooper. Henry Adams was devastated. Uh, he was a wealthy man and he decided to go all the way around the world to try to forget. He took a trip around the world, spent a lot of time in the Far East, in Japan. He studied Buddhism thinking it might give him some solace. Didn't work. Came back to DC, a broken man, but he decided that he could give a tribute to his wife through a beautiful uh, funeral statue in honor of his deceased spouse. He's very wealthy, so he's able to hire the finest sculptor of the time with a grand name, Auguste saint -Gadon. And if you have ever seen the the Denzel Washington movie, Glory. It was Auguste Angadon who came up with the sculpture showing the Massachusetts 54th Regiment, the Black Regiment marching off to battle with the, uh, the, the white officer on horseback, uh, one of the masterpieces of Auguste Angadon. And Henry Adams asked him to come up with a, a fitting funeral tribute uh, to his wife, which uh, exists today in Rock Creek Cemetery in, uh, in DC. And Adams insisted that the funeral sculpture 
did not really evoke the sadness he felt at the death of his wife, but the people of Washington knew that this was baloney, that in fact he was heartbroken, and they gave a nickname to the funeral statue which has stuck to this day. The name of the, of the statue is called Grief, the statue Grief, constructed by, uh, sculpted by uh, Gus Agadon, uh, and at the, uh, the Rock Creek Cemetery in DC. Very sorrowful story. Uh, one of the great talents in the uh, turn of the century, Washington coming to a terrible, terrible end. Now, my tours are of uh, scandal, assassination, intrigue. Uh, I also try to come up with some humorous stories from time to time. And why don't I skip ahead to such a story? Uh, first, first of all, since it has, uh, since we just passed Halloween, let me quickly tell a ghost story. And I see time is passing here. We're, we've been going on for about an hour and I wanna leave time for some questions. So let me uh, tell a couple more stories before we wrap it up. Let me tell a quick ghost story since Halloween just passed and involves a great Navy hero of early America, uh, a fellow named Commodore Stephen Decatur who was a hero of the Barbary Pirate Wars uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, circa 1804, 1810. You can see him in the bottom center of the picture, fighting pirates, not pirates of the uh, Caribbean like Johnny Depp, but the pirates of the Mediterranean, the Barbary Pirates. He was so well regarded that uh, Stephen Decatur was named the, the youngest sea captain in US Navy history at the age of 25. He took command of a warship. Uh, Congress so liked him, they gave him a huge amount of prize money for his daring do in the Barbary Pirate Wars and in the uh, War of 1812. And he used the, his prize money to construct this uh, lavish, this very fine mansion at the edge of Lafayette Square. It's the Decatur House. It's now a history museum. And uh, he since he had earned so much prize money, he was able to afford the finest architect in the country at the time, really the father of American architecture, Benjamin Latrobe, the designer of the US Capitol to construct this fine mansion house for him. And Stephen Decatur and his uh, lovely wife, the daughter of the uh, mayor of Norfolk, Virginia, where there's a main US Navy base even to today, uh, Susan Willa Decatur, and Stephen Decatur, it looked like they would live happily ever after in their mansion, but jealousy intervened uh, in the guise of this fellow Commodore, James Barron, jealous at Stephen Decatur's success and accolades. And he challenged Decatur to a duel in March of 1820, uh, a deadly duel with dueling pistols. Dueling was illegal in Washington, DC, a duel along the lines of Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. Dueling was illegal in DC. And so the two men went out to, the, to where dueling was legal, Bladensburg, Maryland. And they stood at 10 paces. And actually they stood at eight paces because Commodore Barron, like your host tonight, was nearsighted. And he wanted to get, be close enough to get a good shot in at Stephen Decatur. Uh, Decatur was a crack shot didn't want to kill Commodore Barron, just wound him, and he shot him in the hip. Very hurtful, but not a fatal blow. Barron, not nearly as good a shooter, shot Decatur in the groin, uh, cut a, a main artery to the groin. Decatur bled to death, uh, leaving his, his wife, Susan Wheeler Decatur, a widow, uh, and their house vacant. But for, but for weeks afterwards, for weeks after the duel, citizens of Washington, D.C. insisted they saw the ghost of Stephen, Stephen the Gator from the windows of his mansion house, looking longingly to the northeast towards Bladensburg, Maryland, where he had received the fatal wound from his fellow Commodore. So many Washingtonians were scared, and they swore they saw the ghost of Stephen the Gator. So many of them were scared out of their wits that the the windows on the right side picture of the, many of the windows on the right side of the Decatur House Mansion were boarded up to prevent people from seeing the specter 
the bloody ghost of Stephen Decatur staring out of those windows. And if you go to the mansion house today, those very same windows as pictured are still boarded up and have been for 201 years. Uh, it's sort of a Halloween ghost story of Lafayette Square. Um, let's see, let me wrap things up. I'll try to tell a humorous story. Let's see. Ah, let's tell a, go a humorous ghost story also involving duels from uh, the early years of the Republic. Uh, and this fellow was one of the most noted duelists in American history. He's the fellow who's on the statue in the middle of Lafayette Square. That's Andrew Jackson. He was involved in 25 duels, uh, usually as a second, as an assistant to the person actually firing the weapon but also duels himself where he fired the gun. Uh, he had a collection of 100 dueling pistols, Old Hickory, at his estate outside of Nashville. And, but he, one day he made a terrible mistake in agreeing to duel with this guy. This, is, this man's name was Charles Dickinson from Kentucky, who was like the Clint Eastwood of the, uh, of the early 1800s. He was involved in many, many duels, which he never lost, and he always killed his opponent. He killed over 10 people in, in duels. He had unerring aim, steady hand, and Jackson, although a good soldier, was a terrible shot. So Jackson realized he was going to lose the duel unless he backed out, but if you back out of a duel in 1810, 1820, you're branded as a coward. You can't do that. So Jackson and his seconds determined on an incredible strategy to survive the duel, which is pictured somewhat fancifully in this illustration. Jackson stood on the dueling grounds and he took the first bullet. He just stood there and let Dickinson shoot him in the chest within an inch of his heart. The two men were actually about 10 paces apart, not one pace as this uh, illustration shows. Dickinson was convinced he had fatally wounded Jackson, but Jackson pulled himself together and then shot Dickinson dead. Uh, although he kept the bullet within an inch of his heart all through the years of his presidency until his dying day. Now I tell this story, here's a rather comical cartoon about Andrew Jackson. I tell the story about the craziest duel in American history as preface to a, a noted ghost story in Lafayette Square. Uh, involving St. John's Church, which, by the way, uh, dates from the 1810s or 20s and was designed by none other than Benjamin Latrobe, the father of American architecture who designed the, the Cater House Mansion and the U.S. Capitol Building. At St. John's Church, it is said, according to legend and lore, that six ghostly figures that at times of great crisis in American history, six ghostly figures appear in the vestibule of St. John's Church. Six ghostly figures appear at midnight uh, to, during times of crisis to offer Americans solace and uh, to take heart that they'll get, that there's been crises in the past and they'll be able to survive the current crisis as well. For example, the, these six ghostly figures, who by the way, are dressed in colonial attire with powdered wigs, and capes, these six figures appear, have appeared after Pearl Harbor, after 9-11, uh, during times of tremendous strife and conflict. And it is thought that the six ghostly figures who appear to give Americans solace are the first six presidents who appear at St. John's Church. The first six presidents are, of course, Washington, John Adams, Jefferson, Madison, John Quincy Adams, John Adams' son, and James Monroe, the six ghostly figures who appear to help out Americans in times of crisis. But according to the same story, soon after midnight, after the six ghostly figures appear, a seventh ghostly figure appears. And the six presidents grow terrified and take fright and fly off into the night. For the seventh ghostly figure who appears is none other than the seventh president, Andrew Jackson, who would scare the daylights out of everyone. Uh, and so that's one of the ghost stories, a humorous ghost story that you hear.
Andrew Jackson is the sort of fellow that uh, he had sort of a temper to be president, though in a brawl, a battle, you probably want him on your side. So with that humorous story, why don't I uh, end our talk tonight on the, uh, the tours of scandal. We've talked about some scandals and some assassinations and murder attempts, as well as, uh, as, well as some humorous tales and ghost stories. And with that, uh, I'll open, send it back to Robert and maybe take some questions. Bravo, Ed, that was excellent, thank you. Um, I took note of some of the questions that people already asked. If you do have a question, you can type it in the chat or the Q&A in Zoom or the comment section on Facebook. If you join us late, this program is being recorded. It'll be on our YouTube page um, either later this evening or sometime, probably sometime tomorrow. Um, so thank you, Ed, appreciate that. And we did have some questions come in already. So let me send those your way. The first one was, why was the White House placed where it is today, why why that spot as opposed to some other spot in Washington D.C. Was there any significance of that? Well, it's it's a uh, Washington D.C. was not as successful as was as was anticipated in the early days. The, uh, Pierre Lafont and and George Washington and others uh, they placed the uh, two of the main branches, actually the three main branches of government, on opposite sides of Pennsylvania Avenue. The White House on one side, and uh, the Congress in the Capitol building on the other. And the uh, Supreme Court was actually within the Capitol building until the 1930s, until it got its own building. But, and Pierre Lafont and Washington thought that Pennsylvania Avenue would soon be filled up uh, with many residences, hotels. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, the, the, the city remained very much uh, unpopulated until uh, really the late 1800s when, uh, well, before then, the Pennsylvania Avenue was filled up, but the city itself did become a real cosmopolitan city, a true national center until the late 1800s. Uh, but so that, that's, that's one reason for the physical, the visual separation at the time. And, but also politically, constitutionally, it was thought that since we have separate branches of government, checks and balances, that the president and the Congress shouldn't be in the same building, but they should be separated by a, a broad avenue uh, to evoke the, the constitutional notion of checks and balances and separation of powers. Okay, very good, thank you. Let's see, here's a question from Caroline. She says, hi there, I'm looking for info about the house at 28 President Square or 28 Lafayette Square next to 32 President Square, Riggs Bank. My great grandmother, Elizabeth Dixon, lived there during the Civil War. Any um, suggestions on where she could go to learn more about that building? Well, there's, a, there's actually a fascinating story uh, about the Riggs Bank uh, and the Civil War. Uh, during the war, a, uh, a woman, uh, a pro-union woman from uh, Philadelphia appeared outside the Riggs Bank, the George Washington Riggs Bank, who, by the way, was a business partner with William Corcoran of the William Corcoran uh, Art Gallery fame. Uh, and she had a basket of eggs with her, which she placed on the desk of Mr. Riggs. And uh, Mr. Riggs took the basket of eggs, looked inside and took the contents and placed them, placed what was under the eggs in a safety deposit box for the balance of the war. Uh, there was a bit of intrigue involved. The young lady was from Philadelphia. She was pro-union, but at the time she was working in uh, near Alexander, Virginia on the restoration of Mount Vernon, George Washington's estate which was falling to seed. And uh, $100,000 had been collected to restore Mount Vernon by uh, uh, the, the Burke and Herbert Bank in Alexander, Virginia, which still exists today. It's the largest bank in that city, just eight miles from Washington, DC. The Burks and the Herberts were from a Southern town and had Southern sympathies. And they feared that the $100,000 to restore Mount Vernon uh, might be taken by the Union Army uh, which was entering Alexandria and, and used for the Union Army war effort. And so they found this Yankee Bell, if you will, who was working on the Mount Vernon restoration. And they convinced her to take, to hide the $100,000 in a 
a picnic basket under a carton of eggs and take it to the George Washington Riggs Bank in, uh, in DC. And Riggs was in on the scam and he kept the money until the end of the war. And then it was used to restore Mount Vernon. Uh, thus did uh, Southern bankers and a Yankee bell uh, conspire to uh, save the estate of our first president. So that's one anecdote relating to the Riggs, but there, there are others. Wow. Okay. That's pretty, that's crazy. Um, what about how was the name of the building or why was it changed from executive mansion to White House? Someone asks. It has to do, well, we talked about maybe the worst day in Lafayette Square history or the, the history of DC in America, which was April 14th and 15th of 1865, the uh, assassination of Abraham Lincoln and the attempted uh, murder of Secretary Seward. The uh, uh, a contender for the worst day is August 24th, 1814, which is when the, uh, the British Marines, the British Army defeated an American army at Bladensburg, Maryland, where Commodore Decatur was fatally wounded some years later. And the British marched into DC and they burned down the White House. Well, they burned down what was called President's Palace or the Executive Mansion. Uh, it was as it was reconstructed uh, to hide the scorch marks from the British burning, the place, so it is said, was uh, whitewashed. Uh, whitewashed and white paint covered it. And it already had a nickname of the White House even before the War of 1812. But that nickname really took off at that time. And it's remained with us uh, all the way to today. Okay. Good question. Okay. okay. And then someone mentioned just adding a fact that you didn't include the fascinating story of Dan Sickles that you do on your in-person <laughs> tour for those who haven't heard it before. <laughs> I was just, just as we hit the hour mark, I had gotten up to the illustration of Dan Sickles. I'll quickly tell the story. Uh, I tell my guests on the tours that he may be the most the worst villain in the history of Lafayette Square. And people laugh because there's so many contenders. Uh, and so, But Dan Sickles was a, a congressman from New York, 1850s. Uh, he married a woman of 15, the granddaughter of Mozart's lyricist, lovely woman named Teresa, uh, Teresa Sickles. Uh, they and their two children lived on Lafayette Square on Jackson Place. Uh, Dan Sickles was a notorious womanizer, had affairs with many women, but his lovely wife and talented wife, Teresa, decided to get revenge and she had an affair with the district attorney. She had an affair of her own with the district attorney of DC, who happened to be the son of Francis Scott Key, the author of the Star Spangled Banner, uh, none other than Philip Barton Key. When Dan Sickles found out about the affair, he sat Teresa down in their living room and in the presence of their the nurse maid to their two children, forced her to write out a confession. As she was doing so, he looked out the window of their townhouse and in Lafayette Square, he saw his wife's lover, Philip Barton Key, waving a, a handkerchief in her direction to try to get together with her that night, not knowing that her husband was in town in the house. Uh -oh. when, when, when Congressman Sickles, saw the white handkerchief being waved at his wife's direction. It was like waving a red flag to a raging bull. He grabbed three pistols, rushed out into Lafayette Square, shot Phil Barton Key dead, the son of Francis Scott Key. Open and shut murder case. However, Sickles was a wealthy man and, and very clever, and he hired the best defense attorney of the day, a man named Edwin Stanton, to be his defense attorney. Edward Stanton was later the Secretary of War for the Union Army for, for President Lincoln, a brilliant man. And he made the plea that his client was temporarily insane when he saw his wife's lover in Lafayette Square. He had lost it, ran out and killed him. Wouldn't anyone do that in his shoes? The jury bought, bought it. Uh, the first time that the plea of temporary insanity has ever been used uh, in American jurisprudence. Uh, just quick follow-up, Sickles is an incredible character. Uh, his reputation was tarnished <laughs> by murdering the district attorney, but a few years later, the Civil War broke out. As a wealthy man, he was able to raise his own regiments of troops, outfit them with uniforms and guns, and he happened to be in Southern Pennsylvania on July 2nd, 1863, uh, the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, the climactic battle of the Civil War. 
And although he disobeyed orders and got, got his men practically wiped out and lost a leg, uh, he survived and he slowed the Confederate army of Robert E. Lee enough to prevent it from seizing the high ground at Gettysburg, Little Round Top that day. Uh, so he wound up with the Medal of Honor, the Congressional Medal of Honor for losing his unit. But years, and then just one quick anecdote for the worst villain, worst scoundrel in Lafayette Square history. When Sickles was an old man in the early 20th century, he, he was on the commission that set up not the Bunker Hill Battlefield Park, but the, uh, but the Gettysburg National Battlefield Park, a wonderful place to visit. And he was caught with his hands in the cookie jar, stealing funds from the Gettys, Get, Gettysburg Battlefield Commission. So his behavior was consistent throughout his career. Womanizer, uh, killer, thief. My, my, he gets my pick for the worst council in Lafayette Square history. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thanks, Ed. Let's see a few more questions. Um, someone asked, do foreign visitors still ever stay at the White House? You mentioned the Blair Lee House. If they do stay at the White House, how is it decided which place they'll stay at? I think you have to be on a very high level to get invited into the White House. A, a notable example of that was in the Second World War when Franklin Roosevelt had Winston Churchill, the British prime minister, stay at the White House, which led to a hilarious anecdote. Uh, Churchill was a drinker and a workaholic. And one night he was drinking and he uh, in, uh, and working until 3 a.m. And Franklin Roosevelt, and at the time they, they were planning, they were under tremendous pressure right after Pearl Harbor, planning war strategy against Nazi Germany, and Imperial Japan. And Franklin Roosevelt had a, a brainstorm that he couldn't wait until the morning to discuss with his friend Winston. So he barged into Winston Churchill's room uh, right after Winston had taken a hot bath. And he saw Winston Churchill stark naked with uh, nothing but a cigar in his head. And Franklin Roosevelt looked at Churchill in amazement and Winston Churchill looked back and he said, you see, Franklin, you see, it is true. I have nothing, absolutely nothing to hide from you, said Churchill, stark naked like a baby. So people of that level sometimes will get invited into the White House, but otherwise they go to Blair, uh, Blair Lee House. And sometimes, okay. sometimes they, they stay at a hotel downtown, not even by the Lafayette Square. That happened numerously around 1995 when the Secret Service found a, a half-dressed and very drunk man with a foreign accent wandering outside the Blair Lee House in the direction of the White House, trying to get inside the White House to see the president. He claimed that he had a meeting scheduled with the president. And after a while, the Secret Service figured out that this very drunk foreigner was none other than Boris Yeltsin, the president of Russia, <laughs> who, had, who was an alcoholic, had a notorious drinking problem, and uh, was wandering this was wandering Lafayette Square trying to meet Bill Clinton for an impromptu midnight session. <laughs> what a, as someone who hasn't grown up in Washington, D.C., but moved here later, it's really, that's a really fascinating neighborhood, Lafayette Square, and I don't think a lot of people sometimes um, hear about it. You hear about the White House and the Capitol and the mall and stuff, but hopefully that people that are watching that aren't um, in Washington, D.C. or haven't been to Washington, D.C. can really check. It's really a fascinating neighborhood. It is. Uh, it's filled with uh, lore and legend. The uh, in, in fact, uh, and by the way, uh, I should mention that I'm giving a tour tomorrow uh, based on my, my other book about the Capitol building in the history of Congress. And it'll start from the West Lawn of the Capitol at 11.30 a.m. Uh, from the Peace Memorial, the U.S. Grant statue. Uh, so if you're interested in, the, in this, the hidden history, the secret history of the Capitol, as well as the White House, please come on the tour. I'll probably give a, a Lafayette Square tour uh, also soon uh, in the next week or so. Um, but there's a, we just sc really scratched the surface tonight. Uh, my, my book on, on the, the White House has only, not only have to do with uh, Lafayette Square, but I go down 15th Street and 17th Street, uh, down to the National Mall and, and tell the stories uh, that have occurred there as well. One interesting, a couple of interesting facts about Lafayette Square in the early days, it was originally a cemetery, two cemeteries. It was a cemetery for African-Americans from Georgetown in the 1700s. And it was also a graveyard for the Pierce family 
Uh, if you're from DC or familiar with Adams, the Adams Mill neighborhood, there was a mill in Rock Creek Park called the Pierce Mill. It was run by the Pierce family that owned the owned what became Lafayette Square along with that obstinate Scotchman, uh, Mr. Burns. And uh, the early presidents like John Adams, uh, when they looked out the window of the, the White House, they saw, they saw tombstones. They saw the graveyard of the Pierce family, which was thought to be very bad luck. So they asked the Pierce family if they could move their, it was another movable cemetery. And the Pierce family moved their, their family graves to uh, a place called Holmead Cemetery near today's uh, DuPont Circle. So the Lafayette Square uh, has a lot of ghost stories, I think, in part because it, uh, it is indeed haunted. It's had two cemeteries there. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. What about, our, Ed, are you a Washingtonian native or are you from somewhere else? And if you are from somewhere else, how did you end up in Washington, D.C.? I am, uh, I've apparently erased my accent, which originally is from the, the Bronx, New York. But okay. uh, I'm originally from the Bronx, New York, but I've tried to uh, affect a Midwestern <laughs> neutral accent. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've lived I've lived in the D.C. and Washington for several decades now. I live in the, I live in Alexander, Virginia, and actually I'm currently uh, writing another book. My, my dream is to have a a book for each of the four most historic locales in the Capitol region: uh, Lafayette Square in the White House, uh, the Capitol Building, two down, uh, also Georgetown, and the the one I'm working on now is uh, is uh, Alexander, Virginia, Old Town, which is replete has hundreds of buildings from colonial and civil war times and has scores of stories and interesting characters so i try to pick the most interesting locales and give tours and books about them okay so if you missed us ed gave a talk just like this about a month ago um, on the area around the capitol and the capitol building i'll post the link for it in the chat in Zoom and the comment section on Facebook. And then I also posted the link for Ed's um, Washington DC Lafayette Square meetup group um, where he does the in-person tours. So you can find that uh, link in the comment section in Facebook or the chat section on Zoom. Uh, let's see, I thought there was one other question. Oh yeah, here's a, <laughs> this is a question from earlier. So you mentioned the gorgeous Hussey film with jo with Joan Crawford. Do you have any favorite um, films or films that you recommend that are about um, presidents or first ladies, like favorite films of yours that relate to the history of the White House or the occupants that have lived there? I know they've made a lot of films over the years about presidents and first ladies, but like what are the, what are the Ed Moser favorites? The, uh, well, let's see. The, well, the, the Lincoln film, I love Daniel Day-Lewis. And I, I thought the Lincoln film was very good. I mentioned in the uh, the talk uh, the movie Glory with the the sculpted uh, the Henry Adams sculptor, the Denzel Washington uh, and Morgan Freeman movie Glory is uh, is really the most realistic movie I've seen about the Civil War. There's not very many good Civil War movies. Uh, Daniel Day Lewis's uh, other movies like Last of the Mohicans, uh, My Left Foot, uh, The Gangs of New York which is a Civil War era pictures of the, the Irish versus the Anglo-Saxon gangs of New York City in the 1860s. Those are all excellent movies among, among my favorites. What about any films, other films besides the Lincoln one related to the presidents or first ladies that you like or recommend? There's, some, there's a lot out there. The quality is really runs the gamut from, well, like the Lincoln film is probably the best one or one of the best ones. Um, and there's some the, other uh, ones not so good. Movie, People who like uh, like th this sort of history, I, I highly recommend a great uh, HBO series, the TV series John Adams. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's just the the character, the the actors that they got to portray uh, Adams, Jefferson, Ben Franklin, George Washington. They're dead on. Mm -hmm. It's like walking into a, a time tunnel mm -hmm. and meeting these people, and it's done so artfully and humorously, uh, or tragically at times. Uh, I, that could be my my favorite historical movie, although it's really a TV series, the John Adams HBO series. Wonderful. Okay. And of course, it's based on the book uh, by David McCullough, the best-selling book John Adams, which uh, which brings to mind other the best-selling books by Rod Chernow on Hamilton and Washington, which are very good sources for this kind of stuff. Okay. And then I know your capital book just came out, but when will the other one that you're working on about Alexandria be out? Any idea for that? Ways I don't away. have an 
I'm ho I'm hoping uh, spring perhaps. I don't have a publisher uh, yet, but I'm hoping. And it's a little bit different. It, instead of a, a nonfiction history, it's going to be a novel in the guise of a, a murder mystery uh, set in contemporary Alexandria, Virginia, but based on events in the past mm -hmm. that seem to be reenacting themselves in the in, in the current times. So uh, it's it's fun to uh, play around. It'll be deeply about the history of Old Town Alexandria, but uh, set in the present and as a, a fictional book. So it's kind of fun to do, take a different tact on the stuff. Okay, all right, no problem. Excellent, well, thanks, Ed, for joining us and sharing your knowledge. Like I said, I pasted a bunch of the links for different things in the Zoom chat as far as um, the previous recording that Ed did, the sign up for his tours. I also post them in the comment section on Facebook. If you join us late, the recording for this program, it'll probably be uploaded tomorrow. Um, it takes a little bit of time to go through and get that squared away. Um, and again, thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Have a great rest of your Friday. And special thanks to Ed for sharing his knowledge with us. And have a happy Friday, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thank you all. Great. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.